everyone and welcome to today's webinar making the hardest island in the world pest free with Scott Sample um, and we've also got a partner presentation today from GBS. Um, my name is Ted Taylor and I'm a sales and events coordinator at Eagle Technology. I'll be the host or MC for today's, today's presentation and I'm joined online today by Manu King from GBS, Scott Campbell from Eagle Technology and Roland Pamana from the New Zealand Ezra Users Group along with Scott Sample of course. Um, so thanks for joining us for the first of our user presentations as we continue with the NZ Esri Virtual User Conference series following on from that tech update last week. And I suppose one positive from moving these series of presentations online is that we can sit back and listen to a range of speakers live from around the country or from the comfort of our own homes. So, so before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. Um, so. Everyone out there in the audience, you'll all be on mute for the duration of the webinar, but you can ask us questions during the webinar by typing these into the discussion panel here. Um, you can send in questions at any time during the presentation and we'll, we'll collate these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Um, We'll try to get through as many as possible within the time, but if we don't get to a question, don't worry, we'll, um, we'll, we'll pass these on to the presenters and they'll, they'll look to get back to you afterwards. And if you think of anything else you want to ask us or any presenters during the webinar, you can drop us a line at gistraining at eagle.co.nz. Um, today's webinar is going to run for approximately 45 minutes to an hour, depending on, on technical difficulties and all that. Um, and, and if you need to jump off at any point, that's totally fine, as this video will be, will be recorded. Um, afterwards, you'll receive a follow-up email with the link to access the recording, and um, you can also use that link to access other recordings from, from the virtual series. And yeah, if you know anyone else, um, in any colleagues that aren't able to make it today, they can also follow that link and watch these recordings too. So now I'm going to pass over to, to Scott Sample from Ethos Environmental to take it away with his presentation. Over to you, Scott. Thank you very much, Ted, and thanks very much for giving us the opportunity to um, do this virtual, the virtual user conference. I really love the rucks. I'm really, I'm actually um, quite upset that we're not doing them this year um, to catch up with all you guys and see you in person. Um, so I'm coming to you from you live in the beautiful Bay of Plenty at the moment. Um, Roland actually got in first with the rucks this year and asked me to do a presentation on um, what we've been doing out on Waiheke Island. Um, pretty exciting project, uh, looking to make the first predator-free urban island in the world. And I'm definitely going to talk to you about that. But as usual, if you don't know how my presentations go, they ask me to do something and then I go off on this wild tangent and start talking about something else. So I'm going to start with that, just give you a bit of backstory first. For those that don't know me, um, I'm one half of a conservation dog rodent detection team. That little dog you just saw run across the screen just then, that's Millie. Our job is to go around to all these pest-free islands um, and make sure they're still pest-free. Also, as you can see on the screen there, um, I'm a certified drone pilot and I occasionally get out there and make some maps with drones. And generally in my spare time, I just make a hold of the maps that make people's lives in the conservation industry just that little bit easier. So I'd really like to show you just a couple of things I've been doing this year that maybe you haven't caught up on, if maybe if you're not following me on social media and stuff. So um, we very regularly go out to Waikawa Island off the Mahia Peninsula just over here. And you can see there, there's Millie's tracks. Um, and the reason why we go out there um, is because the most adorable and one of the most endangered New Zealand birds, uh, the New Zealand shore plover, live out there. One third, on this little spit just here, one third of the entire world's population of shore plover live. But it's not that crowded because there's only 63 of them out there. So it's really, really important that we make sure that that's rodent free. So we've been out there doing that and we're going out there again soon, hopefully, if this lockdown closes soon. Uh, we've also been to a very, very different place um, looking for a very different bird, uh, which is the super rare endangered, much, much bigger Mallee fowl, which makes these really unusual nests, which is a lot of these massive big like volcano craters in the ground. Dogs probably aren't the best tool for, for these guys. Um, so we've been using drones out there. And as you can see, you could probably picked up that that um, uh, terrain there doesn't look like your standard New Zealand bush. That's because we're out here in the middle of West Island out there looking for these things. So a bit of an unusual job and very, very unusual to the next job after that, which was we flew down to what could be the opposite end of the world, which is the Chatham Islands, 
and trying to help out these little fellas. So these are the Black Robins. Now, everyone knows the story of the Black Robin. We're going to tell you again anyway, because it is so awesome. So this is Mungary Island, right? And this one down here is Little Mungary Island. I'm going to show you where the very, very, very last breeding pair of Black Robins ever in the entire universe existed. Just there on that tree. Now, a couple of very, very forward thinking ecologists, um, uh, Don Merton and Brian Bell, decided to climb up this ridiculous cliff here, grab the very last two birds and take them in their little boat all the way through here. And trust me, it is always as rough as this out there. And they went all the way around here till they found this beach. And then they made a little lavery, released the birds. And now there is actually a breeding population of black robins out there. And they're doing really well. They're doing really well because little dogs like this go out there to make sure that that island, that really special island, is still pest free. I'd just like to point out here, um, this is the first time I've used the new story maps for a presentation and they updated it last night. So I'm sort of learning how to do this on the fly. So far, so good. If we end up off the west coast of Africa in, in stage, it's because something's gone terribly wrong. For now, though, we headed back over to Fjordland. Absolutely spectacular place. This is a place where a guy called um, Richard Henry saved these giant green chickens by rowing them all, uh, all over in his boat to this island here, Resolution Island, um, and releasing them there. Unfortunately, that didn't work. So the stoats found them, but they didn't find them here on Anchor Island. And that's where me and Millie spent, just spent a week running around of course, trying to help the kakapo and to make sure that that place is still pest free because stoats and rats would make a pretty quick job of any kakapo that are on there. And we're, safe. we're glad to say they're all doing really well down there at the moment. And then for something completely different, we jumped on the old drones again. Uh, I was doing a job for an uh, awesome little company down here in the Bay of Plenty called Flightworks, um, who were asked to make this guy here. This isn't Millie, by the way, this is Wink. They just look really similar when you're really close up to them. The difference with Wink, he's got one eye. That's why they call him Wink. They asked us to help out Wink by heading over here to the Firth of Thames to uh, map all the mangroves here. Now, the reason why we're mapping these mangroves is because it's got this horrible invasive species called Spartina out there. And poor old Wink has to walk across this 1400 hectare area looking for it. So we were going to make his job a little bit easier by mapping the whole thing with a high resolution ortho mosaic. And so we can spot some of the areas that are most likely to have Spartina. So Wink's got a bit of more of a fighting chance of being able to find the last one uh, if they want to do a complete eradication one day. So that's just some of the things that we've been up to. Now I'll just start, you know, with what actually what role and want me to talk about, which is what's going on in the Hauraki Gulf. Now, Everything, of course, revolves around one absolutely spectacularly beautiful place in the Hauraki Gulf. There you can see it shining like a beacon, like a, a jewel in the crown of the Gulf just there, Glenfern Sanctuary on Great Barrow Island. And that's always where our stories start. Um, I told you a story a couple of years ago about that, how we did the eradication out there and how we used, you know, spatial technology to, to get the job done. And that was the first, you know, GIS I ever put together. And um, told you the story about this, you know, there was Tony, who was the guy who had this dream, this vision, and my wife, Emma, and I, who were the ground team, the people there getting the job done, making the maps and on the ground, setting the traps and that type of stuff. But there was one other person I didn't actually um, mention during that first presentation, um, who was the fourth person in the team. That was a woman called Joe Ritchie. So um, she was the actual... Um, the actual manager of, of the eradication. So she was the project manager for, for the eradication. And she does this a lot. She does islands a lot. She goes out there, she figures out how she's going to do it, and she puts all the systems in place and makes it happen. Um, unfortunately, um, Tony's no longer with us. Um, and I think the last time I'd seen Joan was actually at his at his funeral. We all sort of went our separate ways and you know we finished on that project. And when I got this call from Joe a few months ago, I was like, Joe, oh God, I haven't spoken to you in ages. It's so good to hear from you. you know, what are you up to? What are you doing? She said, well, just doing islands as usual. I've got um, a job coming up actually you might be interested in. I'm like, absolutely love working with that. would be great. She I said, which one? She said, thinking about doing Waiheke. I'm like, oh, awesome. That's such a great idea. I reckon, you know, that could actually work. So I'm thinking, oh yeah, she wants to send me out there with a dog and you know put some traps out there and teach some of these younger trappers how to do it and they're the best way to to catch the stoats and the rats that are out there. And she said, no, actually, what I want you to do is put together a GIS for me, but I want something really particular, not something just just out of the box, not just you recording how many stoats and rats they're going to catch out there. I want a completely integrated system. 
I don't want to be jumping between programs and apps and all these things for all my different things that I'm doing out there. I just want one thing that is going to manage it all. And I'm pretty sure you can do that type of thing. She said, we want to have health and safety. We want to have a CRM involvement. We want to have timekeeping. We want to have um, all these things that, um, that everyone can go to, to just to one place to say, this is where it's all managed. I'm going to put you in touch with um, my IT GIS guru, um, who's uh, going to be working with you on this. His name's Paul Kivetsenskarps. I've been practicing all day trying to get that name right. Um, so Paul's a quite an accomplished GIS guy in his own right. But when we first met, he said to me, look, I'm thinking about, I've never used it before, but I'm thinking about using this thing called ArcGIS Online. Are you familiar with it? And I said, oh, yeah, I've made one or two maps. So he said, yeah, right. So what do you think you could do all this stuff that Joe's talking about? I said, well, Paul, I, I reckon it could actually. But we, first of all, we've got, we've got to put a portal together. We've got to get you all signed up. We've got to get users' names. What, what type of time frame we're talking here? He said, ah, oh, I'd like to have it up and running in a few weeks if possible. I said, well, we'd better get started. And so we did. So Paul hadn't used Arctis Online before. So it was a big learning experience for him, but it wasn't long before we were just throwing things at a page and getting them to stick. And of course, the first thing you do in any eradicate, any ground-based eradication is you're gonna map out exactly where you're going to put um, all of those traps you're putting out. Now, we are first targeting on targeting stoats, right? So, um, what we, what the the, the organisation that's put that's do, leading all this is Korowaya Waiki, and there are a whole heap of uh, locals who are really passionate about making this place pest free, and they have some pretty um, precise instructions for us. It's like, okay, we are only going to go for stoats to start with, so let's not focus on rats. Let's just get these stoat traps out there. So, okay, so we'll usually use Doc 200s, and we usually put them out at 200 meter. Um, increments basically so we have the best chance of a stoat encountering those traps and these are definitely the best traps for the job and so you throw a fishnet at it and you say that's where i put them um, of course we didn't have just stoats to deal with in this particular job we have people and that's why Matt, this is such a special job is because you can see obviously there if you were to intersect on that those uh, stoat trap potential stoat trap points are going to land in people's backyards and we're going to talk to those people and see if that's okay for them to be in their backyards and if they're all all okay with us doing this trapping and, and what it means to be stoat and potentially rat free one day so we played around with this data a lot and we thought right where is the actually the best place to put each trap not just so that it we've got the best chance of encountering a stoat and potentially a rat should they come ashore there or should they be breeding up in a certain area but so that we're going to be working with people most effectively as well. What's this gonna work for the people who are going about their daily lives in what could potentially be a pest-free area one day, which is a really big deal. So once we started playing around with this data, um, the usually what you do is you, you know, it's like, right, that's where we're gonna you know, put all these traps. Fantastic, let's go deploying traps. That's not what we did. What we did was we put together CRM and our two amazing field workers, Phil and Mary Ann, their job was to head out there with Collector and um, this massive database of all of the landowners and just talk to people. And this is what they did without putting any traps out whatsoever. They went out there and they just door knocked. And we had to put together an app for them to collect as much relevant information about all of those people as we could. So we can get a feel for how do they feel out there? How do people feel about this? So any of their concerns that they had about it, whether they were already trapping themselves um, or whether maybe they're putting out bait, uh, whether they had cats or dogs in the area that they were concerned about. And they talked individually, all those people, and we recorded all that. And that was the most important thing to do in a job like this, because it's so important that all of the public, not just those few passionate people, but everyone gets on board. And that's the only way we're gonna do a predator-free 2050 as well. Now. Um, a bit of a challenge with this was that uh, Mary Ann um, had just come out of a degree where she'd been studying GIS, and Phil is one of those old number eight wire trappers um, who'd never actually used a smartphone before we put this one in his hand. So we had to design something that worked for both of them, and it was great having these two ends of the spectrum to be able to beta test these four things for us. 
while they were doing that, I also said to them, look, we're also putting together a health and safety thing. So that if you, if you guys see any hazards, there's another button just there. So you can put down a point or a polygon and you can say, you can record these things so that when we get some more people involved, because there's going to be a lot of field workers out there pretty soon, um, we can have these hazards recorded already and what stage they're at, whether they're completely unmanaged or minimized or isolated. And while you guys are doing that, I'll be back here in the office putting together the world's most complex survey one, two, three dashboard story map. Um, so I think I've, I may have just gone completely over the top with this one, but it seems to work. Everyone seems to know how to actually use the thing. So inside here, you know, you've got custom URL launches up here. You can launch a new form. You can, um, you've got embedded um, edit mode forms inside there. You've got web hooks that fire off things to do something, to do something else. What all this came from was just a stack of paperwork that their health and safety uh, guy gave me, which um, he said, well, let's just digitize it. And so we just, we digitize it. But instead of having to go through the papers all the time, say, well, that's, this is the paper if you have an incident, this is a paper if you see a hazard, this is a piece of paper for a new worker signing up. It all is in this one story map, which has all these interactive dashboards that all talk to each other. So that was all going together and that was working. I think the best thing about this is if there actually is an incident and someone starts creating a survey one, two, three form in the field, and as soon as they submit that, even if it's only half finished, someone in the office knows there's been an incident and a webhook's gone off and everyone can be working on it really fast. I think that's one of the really powerful things about doing health and safety in ArcGIS Online. While they're out there running around, Joe said, oh, crap. I forgot about carry dieback. I'm supposed to be figuring out if we've got any carry trees out there and if we're going to be spreading carry dieback around the place. Oh, good. I said, don't worry about that, Joe. I know for a fact someone's already done this. Um, there is an authoritative data set out there for carry dieback um, and someone's done a survey, one, two, three, four, for it. So I'll just find out who that is. She goes, no, no time. We need it this afternoon. And so you know what you do. You make a form. Yeah, you say, okay, guys, um, refresh, download another form. It's out there. If you see any carriers there. Now, the person who actually made the carry dieback database and the, that form that I ripped off is probably listening to this right now. If you are that person, please get in contact with me. We've got a couple of weeks downtime now, so maybe we can actually prevent Scott from making any more silos. Anyway, that was added to the mix. Just to make things even more complicated, I thought, why don't we chuck Tracker in there as well? I'll be using Tracker quite a bit with the conservation dogs and it's working really well to keep track of all the conservation dogs as they're running around uh, New Zealand. I thought, you've got two field workers out there. You're about to have a hell of a lot more. I reckon the best way to organize those is if everyone's running Tracker and it seems to be working pretty good. Um, and so suddenly we had all these different things. We had stoke trapping, we had the CRM and we had carried dieback and we had Tracker and poor old Phil's trying to keep on top of it. He's doing a bloody good job of it. Um, but I thought, oh my God, I've got to get 20 more people onto this when they suddenly start downloading Survey123 and Collector and Quick Capture and all the things we're using. This is going to be a, a mess. Because after two weeks, we created this thing. Um, where everyone who was working on it knew what was going on because we'd been there as we'd been creating it. So basically, it took us two weeks to just port all this thing together. Um, and we, you know, I was writing pretty good metadata as we were going along, but we had a lot of forms, we had a lot of web maps, and we potentially had a lot of users about to start setting, putting out the rest of the traps and setting traps out there. So what I did was I got onto App Studio and I made the world's simplest app in App Studio, basically, which all it does is it launches the authoritative forms and web maps that um, that people are going to be using in the field. And so, all, and they're basically restricted to it. They can't actually open anything else. So if they are out there trapping stoats, they click the stoat button and then the stoat uh, collector map pops up. If they uh, put their hours in for the day, they click the timekeeping form and that form pops up. If for some reason they want to stop tracker um, because they're having a long lunch, they don't really want to know about it, they press the tracker button. But if not, tracker starts scheduled in the morning and then scheduled to stop in the afternoon. And that seems to be working as well. So pretty much we were ready to go. Paul's like, right, let's do this. Let's um, sign up a whole heap of more field workers. Let's get all the rest of the traps out there. Let's set them all. Let's start making history. And so that's what we did. And I'm sitting here back in the office watching all this work going, oh, wow, and watching the data coming in and watching people walking around going, this is happening. This is actually really happening. I'm watching history happen before my very eyes. This is going to be the world's first predator-free urban island. This means that we do wacky. 
we can do Great Barrier, we can do Stewart Island, we can start doing mainland urban areas. And this is going to prove, um, the other thing too, is going to make most of the Hauraki Gulf Islands pest free now. That's a huge chunk of islands. I was getting pretty excited about the whole thing. I was really looking forward to seeing what's going to happen when we start ramping up a bit. And then right in the back of the, my mind, there was this, what's going on with this virus? I hope this doesn't affect us at all. I'm surely not. I mean, this is uh, not going to affect field workers. We're out there in the middle of nowhere, but these guys are in an urban environment. Oh, and then there was a lot of phone calls and conversations going back and forth. And then until finally Paul called me one afternoon, he said, we've got 48 hours, we're going to shut us down. When we go to level four, we have to bring everybody in. I was like, well, we can't leave the, the traps set out there. He goes, oh, I know, we've got to close every single trap in 48 hours. Like, oh my God, that's 1,500 traps, Paul. Um, right, tell you what, tell me when everyone's synced. And what I'll do is I'll change it from a setting traps, changing lure, recording what you've caught system to a let's shut this thing down as fast as you can system. So the next morning, so Paul told me that at, at uh, eight o'clock, everyone had synced. I started working on it at nine. By about one in the morning, I had this new system ready to go and all tested and everything like that. At six in the morning, Paul opened his um, one app to control them all, refreshed his web map for stoke collection. And instead of saying, what type of lure have you put in there? What have you caught? It just said, this trap is open and this is where you've got to go next. And so um, when you press the button to say, I've closed that trap, it says this trap is closed. The dashboard's changed overnight as well, so that when the office workers got up and they had a look at it, it just showed where everybody had closed traps, which traps they had to close by responsibility, and also just to put a little bit of excitement into it, I also uh, embedded this little widget down the bottom, which was a live countdown with hours, minutes, and seconds until midnight on the night of lockdown, which probably wasn't necessary, but <laughs> It, it's added some excitement to the whole thing. Anyway, long story short, they managed to close 1,500 traps um, and everything, everyone came in, not just that project, but like all the projects. Like um, I, I didn't realize how much I rely on field workers out there to be bringing in data for me. So all of my systems basically just slowed down. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. I've got at least four weeks here. I could spend this time actually going through and verifying a hybrid data and just tidying things up. And I'm sure that a lot of people have been doing that. Um, you know, that that one shapefile that's sitting on the desktop of your computer that someone emailed you as an attachment, you know, five weeks ago that you still haven't appended into that data set or something. So I thought, right, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to tidy everything up and I'm going to make my systems absolutely perfect for when we come out of the lockdown. Of course, that didn't happen because I did the stupidest thing that I always do. I go up to the top right hand side of the screen and I click on that little hamburger and this thing pops out. And every time I've clicked on one of these icons for the first time, there's gone a year of my life. So what I did this time was went, oh, that's new. I might click on that. Now, if you've clicked on that, chances are you're actually not listening to this right now because you're in a darkened room somewhere uh, making something absolutely awesome. If you haven't clicked on that, then this, is Experience Builder. Experience Builder, everyone says, oh, it's just like App Builder, isn't it? No, this is App Builder on steroids. You know those uh, website builders, the uh, like Wix and Squarespace and those type of things, that's this, but you can add your data in there. So you can make pretty much anything and you can be like in, embedding uh, code behind little widgets inside your data and all sorts of things. And the first thing I made was a way to organize all these ongoing jobs that I've got going on at the moment. So everyone yeah, either is on Arctis Online or Arc Enterprise, um, but everyone's also got a Slack group or a Trello board or some kind of project management software online that I have to remember, oh God, which one, who uses this and who uses that? So now I've just got a really simple interface for figuring out right, where am I at? What am I doing with this project, for including this project right now? which is the presentations I've been working on the last couple of days. But where this stuff starts getting really, really cool is when you're making something and you're prototyping it actually in Experience Builder, which is going to go live on someone else's website at one stage and you can get it to get absolutely perfectly ready to go, like this thing I've been doing for a group called Totopanamu. Now these guys are an absolutely awesome project who are trying very hard and doing a great job at keeping this little island here, Makoya Island, pest free, but also all these other little uh, areas that they're doing trapping and keeping on top of the predators in order to um, 
bring back the bird life in, in the on East Road Rural Day. Now they've also got a whole heap of people who are doing backyard trapping as well. And what they needed was some way to be able to record all of that great mahi that they're doing. And so yeah, we've got them you know, going to hook them up with collector and survey one two three and you know all of the things that they're doing uh, to, um, to 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 do the trapping and the index lines and their bird counts and the trees they're planting that type of stuff. But it's also very accessible for anybody who goes to their website or will be as soon as I move this over to their website where they can do backyard trapping and they can register themselves as a backyard trapper here. And then they what they can do here is once they register themselves, just behind here is just a little bit of JavaScript, um, which is just sitting behind, sitting in a widget inside um, Experience Builder. If they put in their um, email address, because oh, I thought they, they, they didn't want to deal with usernames and passwords and list of stuff, but Email addresses are unique. Everyone's got their own email address. So what this does is this launches what I call a data-driven dashboard. It's actually called URL parameters, but I think data-driven dashboard sounds better. And when they get on there, it only shows their data and they can only uh, add data to their traps. And so when they get on there the first time, they can add a new trap just here, say what type of trap it was, give it a bit of a nickname, so it means something to them. They can move it around using this form just here. Um, and they can also log uh, a catch as well. So we wanted to make as simple as possible for these people that just want to go, oh, caught a rat, here we go. So they can just press rat and then submit. And if they wanted to, we just make this really easy interface just here. So they can say, yeah, it was a ship rat or uh, what type of lure they use and that type of stuff. And that immediately pops up on their personal dashboard. And they can be quite proud of the fact that I've caught seven pests now, but also on the master dashboard as well. I'll we'll show all that. Now, that's not just uh, showing the backyard trapper stuff. That's showing all of their mahi. So if they're doing um, tree planting, this will turn up on their dashboard as well. And if they're, they've got guys, actual contractors out there, you know, doing index lines and doing the walking the line and that type of stuff, that turns up there. So they've, what they've got is an instant snapshot of all the work they're doing, which they're feeding back to the community to say, hey, look how well we're doing at, uh, as kaitiaki, basically, of our area. Okay, conscious of time. So I'm just going to say one other thing that uh, I've been doing a lot on Experience Builder is just keeping track of some of the more complicated things that I create. Now, I've been doing a lot of work with Track over the last 18 months, and it's sort of doing my head in because what they give you straight out of the box is this interface, this web app, and it's a bit naff. I mean, all you can really do with it is you can just have a look and say, okay, well, there's me and there's that line that's there. There's one other dog handler that's got his tracker on at the moment. That's Greg, good to see he's in lockdown. But what I really wanted was this here. I want it to be on a dashboard that's super user-friendly. And if anyone wants to know where Greg is, for example, they can just click on Greg and it'll just zoom to him. There he is. I'm sure Greg doesn't mind me showing everybody where his house is. I'll just get out of there. Um, and what his dogs have been doing they give it to you, they give you tracker as breadcrumbs, as points, so you have to turn them into lines to begin with. And that's what this little thing down here is. There's a process on uh, ArcPro, new 2.5 release, which you can schedule models. So what this thing does is every 10 minutes, it turns all those tracker points into lines. Now this is all great when it works, but as usual with my systems, it's pretty complicated. And every now and then something could stop working, but you don't know if it's at this end or if it's at this end or if it's at this end. And this, what I build on Experience Builder, is this little one-stop shop to be able to see, okay, what are all the processes happening right now? Instead of having to open this tab, open this tab, log in here, log in here, this can all be accessed from one little interface. And that's how I keep track of what the conservation dogs are doing while they're in lockdown. If you want to see what the conservation dogs are doing when they come out of lockdown and what they've been doing for the last few months using spatial technology, I encourage you to check out uh, Eagle and Esri's new marketing campaign, which is called Smell What Others Can't. And it's all about dogs and how cool dogs are and how they uh, find rats in the forest. Well, at least that's what uh, the um, thing that they're going to release this afternoon is all about. There's a little bit of a story uh, about uh, the conservation dogs and what we're doing with Tracker and what we're doing with all those uh, tools that we have in ArcGIS. So I encourage you to check that out. Apparently it's going to be published as soon as this um, webinar is finished. So if you have any questions, feel free to, to tweet them. Hopefully, oh, there we go. Someone has tweeted something just there. Get in touch with me on that email address or via Twitter just there. 
um, and uh, hopefully you can continue learning about the story when we release the story about smell what others can straight after the uh, webinar. Thanks, Ted. Back to you. Awesome. Thanks so much for that, Scott. Um, there's there's a lot of awesome stuff you're doing there. I've, I know I've got a bunch of questions and I'm sure the audience out there does as well. Um, just a reminder for you guys, if you've got any questions for Scott, we'll be covering them at the end of the presentation. Um, you can submit those questions on the right hand side of your webinar view with the little um, question mark button. So please, please send those through and we'll, we'll tackle them soon. So cool. Uh, now I'm gonna hand over to Manu Kang from GBS to take us through the second part of the presentation. Yeah. Here with me. Here we go. Manu, are you there? Yes. Thanks, Ted, and a big thank you to Scott for such an amazing presentation. Um, obviously, very passionate about what you do and for such a, a worthy cause. Uh, it's great to see actually these three tools in action and um, you know the way you had to be um, agile and dynamic with COVID virus, um, forcing you guys to change tack a little bit. It's just pretty cool. Um, morning, everyone. Hope you're all safe and well. Um, so yes, my name is Manu King and I'm a Senior Geospatial Consultant. I've been in the industry for about 30 years, um, awfully long time. Um, and I've known GBS for about 14, um, but I didn't start working with them until about six weeks ago. Um, as GBS is a, a RUC partner, I would just like to steal 10 minutes of your time and unashamedly put a plug in for GBS, uh, introduce to you who we are, what we do. And while we have a range of products, I'm going to highlight just a couple of them the Wahi uh, mapping solution and our automated reporting to that really showcases our GBS expertise and problem solving approach. So who are we? What gets us up in the morning? Well, we are a group of GIS and IT specialists passionate about partnering with clients to deliver world-class uh, location intelligence solutions. In particular, we provide expertise in strategic and planning advice from helping you put your spatial strategy together and win the hearts and minds of your stakeholders, right through to the actual um, planning and ESRI um, architecture design work, creating a transition plan that will take you from your current state um, to a desired future state, and then helping you also implement that platform. We have a very strong partnering ethos, um, and one an example of that is with Eagle. We've started the uh, Utilities Advantage Program, leveraging off the ARC GIS utility network extension. We also have a, uh, yeah, we, we're made up of a team of architects, developers, BAs, PMs, all experts in the ARC GIS ESRI platform. Our approach is always out of the box first, configure second, and develop or customize third. We provide a range of geospatial products and, and some support, and one of those um, support pro programs we have is the GBS support program. Um, we have basically a, a dedicated team who um, can help you with preventative maintenance, upgrades, and can also provide uh, project management and monitoring type services. Basically, we can tailor our GPS to your needs. Yeah, um, regarding the core products, um, including Wahi and automated uh, reporting tool, I'll talk to you about those a little in a minute. Um, and finally, I just want to touch on um, a number of our clients have been or are beginning to grapple with IT and digital transformation. Um, we are working closely with them, helping them innovate and to develop new ways of working. In particular, we provide expertise in how ESRI solutions can and will integrate as part of your digital transformation journey. Where are we located? Um, our head office is in Auckland. Uh, we do now have a presence of Wellington, and if you could see me, I'll be putting my hand up and saying that's me. Uh, we also have a um, office in the Republic of Korea or South Korea, and we've also um, have a presence in the USA. Now, prior to COVID-19, we were actively growing our Wellington and Korean teams. Um, obviously, like many others, we're just putting a little bit, a uh, few things on hold there and just watching and see what happens. Um, but one of the things I think that differentiates us from um, others is that we are Asia Pacific's only ESRI Gold partner. This gold status is for us is an endorsement that our work is off the high standard. 
To maintain our gold standards, we must demonstrate our commitment to our ArcGIS platform as the cornerstone of our solutions and services. We work with ESRI International and our local ESRI distributor, Eagle Technology, to achieve agreed business plan objectives aligned with ESRI's vision, goals, and industry focus areas. Look, we've been around for 18 years and we have clients that cross multiple sectors, from central and government, uh, local government agencies, right through to private companies in forestry, utilities, transport, logistics, iwi, agriculture, and fast moving consumer goods such as supermarkets. And we don't just have um, clients in, in New Zealand, they're also in Australia, obviously South Korea, Chile, Canada, and the States. So in summary, that's just a small insight into who, uh, who we are and what we do. So next, I'd just like to introduce you to two of our um, products that really demonstrates what we do. And that is Wahi, our um, web-based um, viewer, and our automated reporting tool, Art. So what is Wahi? Wahi is basically an intuitive mapping solution that's completely configurable and customizable to what you want. And you're going to hear me say that a few times. Um, key features of Wahi included, but not limited to, is a configurable gallery application where you can display a collection of content to your users based on what has been shared with them in their portal for ArcGIS or ArcGIS online group. You can customize the Wahi viewer using a collection of custom Wahi and Esri pots widgets, all wrapped up in your own organization's brand or theme. You can inter interrogate with your pre predefined geocortex workflow processes and reports using the Wahi and geocortex integration. You can connect to your enterprise property asset management system using the Wahi and Isolink integration. And finally, you can generate complex reporting using the automated reporting tool or art and Wahi integration. Now, just for a little demo, um, I must give a shout out to Jade Weidman, um, one of um, our um, clever um, ESRI um, technicians back in uh, GBS. Um, those of you who know me, we wouldn't know I wouldn't be able to put this together. Um, so yeah, look, there's four um, enhanced widgets I just want to show in this. Um, and, but before I demonstrate, sorry, uh, okay, we've started with the query. <laughs> Um, so look, so this is the query wi uh, widget, um, and uh, what we've done is set up some pre predefined. Sorry, T, could you stop? There? Pause that for a minute. Sure thing. Just pause that. <laughs> Thanks. So yeah, so what you'll see is basically the, the uh, enhanced uh, results widget that um, the three other widgets will be um, displaying the results in. Um, the user can view and interact with attributes of of the selected features. And if you can customize exactly to how each layer's attribute data is displayed and any related data at a database level can be shown as well. So um, what we've just what you've just seen here or to the end of it is our query plus widget. Um, this is pretty much um, showcases uh, the census mesh block 2013 uh, data or table and in it we're selecting a particular area. Um, a list of results was returned and then you can uh, select each result and configure it in a different color. The next one, if you just keep that playing, that'll be great. Here we go. Is our select uh, widget, and this one's pretty cool. So what you can do here is you can select by attributes. Once it starts going. Sorry about that. I'll skip forward back to where we were. It's okay. Here we go. Ah, always happens. Okay, so we're selecting from the roads uh, table, selected by attribute, and we're going to select on a suburb, pick a value, in this case. Okay, I'm not sure with, for the rest of you, but that seems to be running quite slow. Uh, the, yeah, the next one is that you can search by geometry. Um, and you can uh, search by one shape or multiple shapes. And then finally, the third one is where you can select 
um, use an existing selection, um, sorry, use a previous selection and select um, using that to select other um, um, layers um, from yeah, within that same area. Look, the search widget, uh, this widget is configured to search individual layers, uh, specific fields, and here you can also see wildcard searching. The enhanced search widget can be configured to trigger and identify with search results. Outputs are displayed in the results widget and highlighted on the map. So one of the things I do want to say is that at the bottom there is the wahi.kiwi um, website. You can go there and play to your heart's content. Um, you shouldn't break it like I think I just did. Um, but yeah, um, knock yourself out. So why wahi? Well, basically, we've done the hard work for you. We've basically created a framework of out of the box and customized functionality. We've overcome um, web app builder limitations and provided some really cool tools that you've seen um, in the demo. These include the search and query tools, uh, superior flexible presentation tools, and advanced drawing and info sharing type tools. Finally, did you know that license that um, Wahi is license free to New Zealand government agencies that central and local and including um, subsidiaries or council controlled organizations? We, we release Wahi um, generally in time with the Esri Web App Builder product releases so that you can be sure that the Wahi solution always works seamlessly with the latest Web App um, Builder version. Um, and at the same time, we rely on the Wahi community, our clients, to tell us, hey, look, um, we think there's a, um, a, a useful tool that we want, uh, we want you to develop for us. And we look at that and we think, you know what, other people could benefit from that. So we'll add that to the and we'll make a decision to uh, add that to the um, to the stock standard Wahi as well. We have a Wahi support team that can support your initial launch, provide one-on-one -on -one training, and work with you on, on any specific Wahi enhancements. And finally, and I've said this before, a few times now, it is highly customizable. In fact, just about every client instance of Wahi has a different look and feel, but fundamentally, it's Wahi at its core. So next up is ART, or our automated reporting tool. Now this ART is a highly sophisticated reporting tool using REST services. It leverages off ArcGIS Enterprise and uses your organization's pre-configured templates to generate maps and reports. ART is designed with modern administration interfaces and with some training you can administer and implement the tool yourself. It can easily integrate with your organization's systems using APIs or SQL queries from asset management reporting through to land information memorandums or LIMS, the use and application of ART is endless. Now, I don't actually have a demo of ART because to be honest, you don't actually see a lot. Um, so what I've done is grabbed a, an example of one of our clients. So Hutt City Council, John Floyd has been using ART since 2016. In John's own words, he was looking for an automated solution to help his LIM officers pull together the variety of data to create LIM reports. Since 2016, we have worked closely, continually work, working closely with John to improve art and enable more functionality. This has served well for John, his team, and his internal clients. So why art? Simply, it's a quick and simple tool for any organization wishing to automate regular spatial reporting requirements. The key benefit is that it saves time, reduces human, human error, and that it's, it's, it's automated and therefore it's more consistent. And also finally, GBS can extend ART to meet specific business needs. So we have a few other clients also using ART, not just for limb reporting, but for um, um, PIMS as well, property information memorandums, some asset uh, reporting. And also we're talking to another council um, who want to use ART for their cons conservation information system project. And basically that's it. So there's just a small insight uh, into what we are passionate about. On behalf of the GBS team, just like to thank you for your time. And if you'd like to know uh, anything, uh, what I've discussed in the above, please contact myself or contact um, anyone at GBS. Thank you. Great, thanks very much for that, Manu.
Um, sorry about those technical difficulties, guys. It always happens, as you know. But if, if you want to have a play around for yourself, just follow that link um, in the presentation and yeah, just, just have a play around. Cool, so that brings us to the end of today's presentations. We'll now jump into the Q&A. So if you've asked any questions during the presentation, we'll, we'll start addressing those now. And if you've got any other ones, please please submit them now and, and we'll get started. Okay, um, we'll have a look at the question panel here. Um, what's the first one? So, hi Scott, awesome presentation. I um, was just wondering if your field workers are using their phone's GPS on collector or if they're using a separate GPS device and load a base map onto their device or are they just downloading the map areas? Yeah, so I um, haven't had to use a separate GPS yet. Um, it's come up a lot where people have said, is this going to be accurate enough? And in the work that we do, if you're within four meters, I always say you're only gonna get within four meters, that's all I can guarantee, depending on the model of your phone. Um, if you're in four meters of a stoat trap, you're gonna know it's there. If you're in four meters of where a dog last ro located a rat, where the rats are moving, you know, or weeds or whatever it is. And we've all pretty much said, actually that's accurate enough. Um, although I did have someone ask me the other day, they're looking for frogs and said, um, how close can you get it? I say, oh, look, you can get these, you know, external devices. I said, yeah, we need to get down to like a centimetre. So I said, oh, yes, how big are these frogs? Like, are they the size of your fingernail? It's like, oh, well, that's, yeah, that's a totally different thing. Haven't had to use it yet, but yeah, there are things that can do that. Um, with the maps, um, yeah, well, Waikiki's pretty easy. It's only one area. Um, and you can create map areas, obviously, now in Arctis Online, um, and you can get them to update. I have had that failing a bit. Um, and so I'm still getting people on Android, I should say, um, I'm still getting people to like download a map area themselves on their phone. Latest update just came through again. I'm going to try it again. And if it's more stable, I'll start doing that. Uh, have had to sideload uh, um, huge auth mosaics before. Um, so that works as well. Um, just for the, like, for instance, that massive uh, mangrove area was a sideloaded, it's a two gig JPEG basically. Awesome. Uh, another question here, for someone that may have missed it during the presentation, what was the reason for closing all those traps on, on Waiheke Island and why did you have to do that so quickly? There's, there's a bit of a science to stoat trapping. Um, so it, the worst thing that could possibly happen is if your animals, uh, your in-situ animals, your external animals, um, become neophobic to your devices. Your devices have to be presented absolutely perfectly all the time, especially in a situation like this where they're on an island and we're using these, say, Doc 200 traps and um, a stoat goes there and goes, um, oh, I remember this Doc 200 trap that I came across before and this you know, upset me because it wasn't presented right. So we have to check them all the time to make sure that they've got fresh lure in them, that there's nothing in there that's going to start all the stoats. So they are going to want to go in there every time. Um, and the, the crux of it came down to, we can't have people going out there, walking the streets, doing their job in level four. Um, so we can't just leave them open. So we, we can't just close one or two. You've got to close all of them because they have to be consistent across the entire project because a stoat is going to encounter one bad trap and it's going to remember that and then it's going to say, well, I'm not going to go into that trap over there either, um, which is a long, I mean, I could go on for hours about this, but that's generally the crux of why we treat every trap the same, basically. Yes. Okay, I've um, got another one here. Um, does tracker work if you're out of cell phone range? Absolutely. Tracker works on um, the Chatham Islands for three weeks, just walking around the Chatham Islands, which has no mobile reception. Um, and uh, last time when they had had no access to Wi-Fi either. So I walked around those islands for three weeks offline with collector and tracker, got to Christchurch Airport on the way home and everything went sync and it was all on the cloud. Simple as that, eh? Simple as that. It's, and track is awesome. It, as an app, it is absolutely awesome. It uses bugger all um, power and just keeps ticking over on the background. So yeah, can't fault it at the moment. Got got another question here, which I suppose it's, it's more of a comment. Um, someone from from Botany Downs College is looking to to make best use of Survey One Two Three for for rat trapping as well, and 
Uh, it looks like Experience Builder might be the answer. So that's that's awesome that you're able to, to showcase Experience Builder and a, as a solution. So we, we can probably put you in touch with um, with this attendee after the webinar to, um, to, sure. to figure it out as well. Um, let's have a look. Um, Thank I've you very much question. for all the for all the nice comments here, by the way. Oh, look, there's Joe Ritchie. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Hey, Scott, I've, I've got another question for you as well. Um, I'm sure Millie's very fit when she's walking around rat trapping yeah. all day. Um, now that you guys are in lockdown, how how are you keeping her in shape, or, or is she just putting her feet up for for a few weeks? No, highly trained uh, conservation dogs um, that are as tightly wound as my Jack Russell don't put their feet up. Um, they they rest for a couple of days, um, and they recover and they put weight on to go to the next job. And if they're in lockdown for several weeks, um, they start getting a bit antsy. And at, that's why right now my daughter is holding Millie to stop her from running around everywhere and barking and trying to go off and find rats around the neighbourhood um, because that's basically what she's trying to do at the moment. So she's a lot of work at the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> she just wants to work. She just wants to go find rats. Um, so yeah, we're doing a lot of drills and stuff with her at the moment and hiding rats around the place for her, but it's still not the same. She wants to get back out there to those islands and yeah. I'm a little bit the same myself actually. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure I'm sure everyone's keen keen to get back out there and get stuck in. Um, we've got another question here. The adjustment of positions of traps from the perfect grid to the final placements. Uh, was any consideration of stoke habitat or movement corridors considered or, or really just the land ownership? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's an awesome question. And I wish I could, and then once again, we could spend hours talking about it. And that was, once again, that was Paul um, Kivets and Scarves um, spending a lot of time on that, uh, on that feature class, just moving things around slightly. We should go there. We should go there. We should go there. Um, because it really isn't just a matter of, oh, we'll just space them at 200 metres. We don't do that anymore. We put them in places where we know we need a trap. And some places you'll see on that map, it's really intensive. and Obviously, the big thing with um, Waikiki Island is um, is the vectors. So you're going to get things coming ashore, and so you need to have an area really well protected. Um, you're just going to assume that it's going to be a rat or a stoat that's going to come in on a boat in that area, and you have to be on top of it. And so things like that and habitat, yeah, huge, huge influence on where you put your traps. Mm -hmm. um, here's another question about experience builder. And, and tracker as well. Does 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 tracker require data, or does it just run solely off GPS? Well, it has to sync at some stage. Um, and so, uh, you, as I said, like you know, you're on the Chatham Islands. There's no mobile reception down there. There's no chance of getting on the internet, um, and it just keeps on ticking over and storing it locally on your phone um, until you, you come into reception, you know, whether Wi-Fi or, or mobile. Um, so yeah, it doesn't require data at all. I guess that's probably repeating the other question. Um, is it free? No, no, it's not. It's an extension. So you have to actually um, get your organisation to uh, to get that extension, and then you have to uh, assign it to your users, which I'm busily trying to do at the moment. Yeah. And when you were showing your your App Studio app, your simplest app ever, did you have to use any code to build that, or is it all is it all out of the box? Yeah, it's all code. Um, it's sort of it's a bit. I haven't spent a lot of time on App Studio. You know, you can you can copy and paste and click and drag a bit, but it, once you publish the APK, you look at it and you go, oh, that's not right. And so then you start getting in and you start doing a little bit of coding in there as well. So yeah, uh, half and half, I think. You have to know a little bit of code to get things doing exactly what you want them to do. And you, you have to actually, you know, write the launch, with, you know, the custom URLs and that type of stuff, which is all pretty easy. But yeah, it does, it does, it does help do a little bit of coding in there as well. Yeah, yeah. And um, that guy was it? Was it Mike that had never used a smartphone before? Do you think he's now converted after after his experience Phil. with your app? <laughs> oh, sorry, Phil. <laughs> I don't know. I have to talk to him. Phil's one of those quiet guys. That I really hope that he's enjoying and you know using all this stuff. But I don't really I don't really hear. I have to ask uh, Paul about that. Um, but I think the the, the best uh, feedback you can get is when people don't say, oh. It's not working. I can't work it. And when you see their their data sync and you see that they've all their attributes are in the right fields and that type of stuff, it's like, well, I must have explained it properly because the data's good. So um, as far as I know, Phil's enjoying it. 
tolerating it maybe. Yeah. yeah. I suppose no news is good news in there in, in some cases. Yeah, exactly there right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another question has come, come in. Is, is the app distributed on the app stores or are you using the um, App Studio Player? No, not using the App Studio Player. Great question, Sam Williamson. Um, so what I did was I just exported an APK and then man oh, actually tell you the truth, the APK is hosted on Arctis Online. And so people can download it via a document link off of their portal straight onto their phone and just run it. And then it says, are you sure you trust this app, which isn't from the Play Store? And you say yes. And then away it goes. You're going to have a huge problem doing that on Apple, obviously, but it works on Android. Okay. Um, if, if you guys have any more questions, um, please send them through now and we'll try and answer them. We've got a, we've got a couple of minutes left, so hopefully we can get across them. There's, there's also there's a lot of great feedback in here, Scott. Um, so well done. Oh, no. And also to you, to you. Everyone's been really, really friendly today. I'm just trying to read through it all now, actually. Thank you, everybody that's wrote written nice comments. Um, someone said about um, where else can we follow you? I've just put my Instagram and Facebook. I'm very, very slack on Facebook. Oh, I put the wrong URL there. Yeah, perhaps we can add your um, your social media links to, to some, some follow-up emails that go out for everyone, for people that are interested. Yeah, that'd be cool. It's all yeah. just Scott Sable anyway. Can I yep. edit that? Probably not. not. Sure. Okay. Anyway, yeah. Here's, here's, here's another question. Advice. Yes. Here's another question for you. Have you got anything on your technology wish list to try it in the field? <laughs> yes. Um, gosh, where do you start with that? To actually try in the field. Um, yeah. I'm just making a whole heap of stuff at the moment. Um, I just really want to get a really good integration between Tracker and um, and Collector. You can see you can see Tracker on Collector in in um, iOS now. And the last update I downloaded, you still couldn't see it on Android. Um, so I had to do this dodgy little um, thing in the background to make the track turn up on Collector. They're just I just really want more integration between like the apps, especially like between Collector and Survey. One, two, three, and and um, tracker. Um, yeah, I don't know. I could go on for hours about that, but that's a great question. And fi finally, we'll probably just make this one our last one of the day. Can you donate to support the conservation dogs? It's a good question. I don't, I don't think you can. Um, there, if you go to um, the see what others can't thing that hopefully everyone just then like me just got a um, email about. Um, there's a link there which goes to a story map, which is the what I like to call the smell what others can't presentation, um, which is the thing that we did with Ryan um, for this this media campaign. Um, there is a link on there to the conservation dogs, so you can go there and read all about them. Um, I think I think it's possible if you are super keen to donate, I'll put you in touch with um, the powers that be who um, organise the program, and I'm sure they would love to name a dog after you or something. Great. Okay, guys, I think we'll, we'll wrap up the Q&A there. Um, if you have any further questions, please email us at gistraining.co.nz or alternatively, you can get in touch with Scott and, and Manu directly. Um, okay, and, and also, yeah, this as, as, as I said earlier, this recording will be available um, online in this link here, the, the hash, slash channel slash bucks 2020. And also, there's there's more there's more webinars in this series. This is the first of our user presentations. Um, the next one will be taking place um, next week well, on Wednesday, the 15th of April, same time at 11 after Easter. Um, if you haven't yet registered for that, you can follow this top link here on the Eagle website and sign up there. Um, massive thanks to, to all of today's presenters. And although the Rucks didn't, didn't eventuate themselves, um, and, Sure, this this buck series is a pretty good alternative given the situation, and um, massive thanks to the NZUG and the partners GBS Eagle and the newest partner Altera, and oh, the user group would also like to say a very big thank you to those sponsors who had planned to be a part of the Rux um, National Map GeoWorks 
Jacob and First Name. And th thanks to all you guys for tuning in for um, for the hour today. Stay safe out there and we look forward to connecting with you face to face next week. And we'll hopefully see you online next Wednesday for the next of our presentations. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.